Welcome to this edition of uh, Criminal Mischief, the Art and Science of Crime Fiction. I'm D.P. Lyle. Today I want to talk about the mysterious human brain in many of its aspects. Obviously this is a massive subject and there's no way we're going to cover it, a whole lot about it, but I want to hit on some high points that maybe many of you can use in your stories when you're creating characters, uh, particularly those with brain injuries of various types. So let's start by just talking about head trauma and what do we mean by that, or our, our, our cerebral, our, our uh, central nervous system injuries. Well, most people think of direct uh, blunt head trauma, which is automobile accidents, blows to the head, you know, sucker punches, all of those things. And, and, but other things can injure the brain, infections, uh, meningitis, uh, there's very, various types of abscesses that can occur in the brain that can even come from infections on heart valves and things like that. People who get septic from uh, kidney infections and it seeds the bloodstream, you can end up with abscesses and infections in the brain. There can be what we call anoxic, which is without uh, blood supply. Uh, anoxia means without oxygen. So if someone drowns or if someone suffers a cardiac arrest or if someone is in a low oxygen environment uh, for a long period of time, uh, this can kill off brain cells and this can lead to significant brain injury. And then there's vascular, which it comes in a lot of different ways. There are strokes of uh, uh, what we call occlusive strokes, where a blood vessel is closed by a clot, uh, by atherosclerosis, that kind of thing. And the blood supply to the portion of the brain downstream is cut off, and that area of the brain dies. We call that a stroke or a CVA, a cerebral vascular accident. But there's also bleeding into the brain that can follow trauma or sometimes spontaneously from things like aneurysms, and the bleeding can occur within the brain tissue or around the brain and compress the brain. Regardless of what, all of these things can do damage to the brain. <clears throat> well, the brain's not a simple thing to understand. Uh, I'm a cardiologist, so I understand the heart really well. The heart's pretty simple, you know, as dumb guys get into cardiology. Um, it's a pump. You know, it's got some chambers to receive the blood back from the body and from the lungs, and it dumps that through valves, which are one-way doors into the main pumping chambers, and they're pumped out in the case of the right ventricle to the lungs and the left ventricle to the body, and it's a circuit, and it's pretty simple to understand. It's basically plumbing. Now, there's electrical things and, and uh, electromechanical things that go along that make it more complex, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like the fuel pump on your car. The brain, on the other hand, is a whole different animal. We don't understand it at all. We think we do. We understand some things about it, but it is extremely complex. I mean, when you've got hundreds of millions of cells that are interconnected with hundreds of millions of, of axons and fibers, and different areas control different things, and different areas talk to other areas, uh, I mean, the, the, the potential for things to go wrong is huge huge. Think about a large city with multiple freeways like Los Angeles. Let a car accident happen on one of those freeways and the impact can be spread for miles and miles and miles in every direction. Uh, out here in California, when it rains, the first day of rain, we used to have about 100 accidents during the day because people in California can't drive in the rain and it becomes like multiple strokes all over the city. So the brain is interconnected that way. And even though there's certain areas that do certain things, they talk to each other. And so any interference in either an area or the communication between two areas can cause significant problems. And these can create character changes on, on both physical, psychological, emotional, mental, you name it, lots of different areas. And let's talk about some of that. For instance, a brain injury can cause physical abnormalities. A person can have speech defects. They cannot be able to talk, not be able to, to move their mouth in the right way. They cannot be able to swallow. This happens a lot with strokes. They might be paralyzed on one side or partially paralyzed. Uh, they might have problems with vision or with hearing or with smell or, you, or with any of the senses. And so all of these things can happen, uh, and those are physical. There's also behavioral changes. 
After certain brain injuries, some people become combative and angry. Other people become passive and stoic. And others others can't remember anything or can't form speech. Uh, we call it aphasia. Um, they can't understand things. Their personality changes. All kinds of things happen to people in a behavioral sort of way. They may have trouble with language and communication. They may not be able to understand or to form speech or to recognize objects or all kinds of things. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The point is, is that any type of injury to the brain can cause a multitude and wide-ranging alteration in the way the brain functions and therefore in the way the person, or in your case, the character, behaves. So let's look. The thing about the brain is it is kind of laid out like a map. So there's these little different cities that I talked about before. You know, there's Beverly Hills and Pacific Palisades and Hollywood and, and all of that in L.A., uh, all of those little cities have different personalities. Well, so do different areas of the brain. They do different things. Now, I'm, I got, I got, a, as usually, I have show notes, and you'll find them on my blog and, and on my website, and there'll be links to that. And you can go look at all of this stuff and, and, and investigate it a little bit more because it is a little complex. But then again, it's not. The brain lobes, which are the areas of the brain that are separated into separate things that we call lobes. The frontal lobe is in the front of the brain, above the eyes, the forehead, that kind of thing. And it is intimately involved in your personality and your emotions and your intellect and your judgment and problem solving and attention, how awake you are, uh, organizing things and social skills. And people who have injuries to those areas any of those things can change. They can become emotional. They can become flat, a flat affect where they don't respond. Frontal lobotomies were done for aggressive behavior back in the day. Uh, and you may remember One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. If you haven't read the book or, or seen the movie, you should. But the Jack Nicholson character ended up getting a frontal lobotomy, and he changed from this uh, wild, manic, aggressive guy into this zombie. Um and that's what that's because the frontal lobe controls so much of our emotions and our and our intellect and our ability to organize and do things and social skills. There's also a special area of the frontal lobe down toward the bottom back called Broca's area. And this has to do with speech and writing and particularly with expressing it, trying to form words and make sentences and say things and try to write things in some coherent fashion. Boy, we writers all have, have problems with that. I always blame it on my broca area when I can't make a good sentence. Um, and we'll talk about that more later. Next is the parietal lobe, which is up on the side of the head on either side, and uh, it's above the ears. Uh, and, and it controls motor and sensory functions. And by motor, I mean your ability to do things, to move a hand, to move a foot, to move a leg, to twitch your nose. All that stuff is controlled uh, in that area. And it also controls sensory functions, which you touch something hot, you feel it. And it comes through that area of the brain, through the parietal lobe, certain, certain areas of it. And it also helps with uh, vision and hearing uh, in some respects. Uh, and next would be the temporal lobe. Now this is just behind the ear toward the back of the brain. And it's kind of a special lobe. The temporal lobe is interesting. It is extremely interesting. Uh, it has to do with language and memory and emotions and perceptions. And there's a special area there called Wernicke's area, which impacts speech formation and understanding. And again, we'll talk more about that and Broca's area and Wernicke's area and how they work together uh, to understand and create speech. But temporal lobe really has to do with emotions, with anger, with fear, with, with lots of you know, sexual appetite, all kinds of stuff seems to come from the temporal area. And then the last lobe is called the occipital area, and that's toward the back of the brain, on the back of the head. Now, remember, the brain is divided in a right and left, and you've heard all that right brain, left brain stuff, and that's, there's some truth to all of that. But when we're talking about neuroanatomy and neurophysiology, we're often talking about what does what and what controls what part of the body. And uh, in, in general, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. Not sure why that is, but I didn't invent it, I didn't create it, and I don't know the guy that did. So uh, um, it, it's, it, it's interesting that, that everything changes. If you look at vision 
And I get asked a lot, I want the character to be injured and to go blind. Well, it's hard to do that with a, with a blow to the head. There are areas, there are certain things that can happen that can cause total blindness. But remember, you've got the occipital lobes control vision. You've got a right one and a left one. And the way it works, and it's very complex neuroanatomy, is that the fibers that come from the right side, right occipital lobe, actually control the right side of the retinas of both eyes. but So that means that it actually controls looking to the left. Because if you think about your eyeball as a globe, the light coming in from the left that comes through the pupil would strike the right side of the retina. And light that comes in from the right come through the pupil would strike the left side of the retina. Think about the sun outside your window and which way that light falls on the floor uh, or the countertop or whatever. Uh, so an injury to the right side of the brain might affect the, the vision in the right side of the retina, but it would be the left side of the visual field. And a, a damage to that area that is severe can shut down all vision in the right side of the retina of both eyes and therefore knock out the visual field on the left side completely. We call that homonymous hemianopsia. <laughs> we have big words for everything and you can look all this up and there's some, there's some links to it that'll show you all of that. So the point is, is that certain areas of the brain when injured can cause certain problems. Let's talk about another one. It's called aphasia. And this is a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating topic. Um, aphasia simply means that you can't quite communicate. And it can be either receptive or expressive or both. Now, receptive aphasia means that the person cannot understand what's coming at them. In other words, they might some, you might say something to them and they don't understand it. They don't know what you're saying. They may hear the words. It's not that they, they have a problem with hearing. It's they don't understand them. They can't make sense of them. Or you write something down, and they say, I, I don't know what this says. I can't read this. I can't, I can't read it all. This happens after strokes and after trauma. Um, it may be that you, you show them an object, and they don't know what that object is. These are receptive aphasias. Expressive aphasia means that they hear what you say and they understand it, but they can't respond properly. You may say, uh, what's your name? And they're searching for it and searching for it. You may say, what day is it today? And they know what day it is, but, but, but they can't get it out. They can't express what they're feeling. And this can come in oh, a myriad of combinations and it can be incredibly fascinating. I remember in medical school, we had this, this guy that had had a stroke and he had had uh, partial ex uh, receptive and partial expressive aphasia. And we would test, we would test his recovery from this. Um, if you came in and said, point to my watch, and he would do that, he'd point to your watch. Okay. If you wrote on a piece of paper, watch and said, point to that, he got this confused look on his face. He couldn't, he couldn't do it. But if you held up the watch and said, what is this? He would struggle and struggle and struggle. But if you gave him a pen and piece of paper, said, write down what this is, he would write down watch. So I don't remember all the de details. <laughs> it's been a long time ago. The point I'm making here is that these expressive and receptive aphasias come in many, many, many different flavors. And you can, you can look online and find all kinds of examples of this. And it's like there's an out of phase in what you understand and what you perceive and what you're able to output, what you're able to say or write or spell. It, 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 I remember this guy. I do remember one thing of this guy. Uh, you would say, uh, write down, uh, point to, point to the watch and he'd point to the watch. And then you'd say, uh, write down what this is and he couldn't do it. And then you could say W A T C H and he could say, watch, 
but if you ask him to write down watch, he couldn't write it down. It, it, it's interesting. It's, it's a fascinating subject. Two things that, that have to do with um, that I think that writers will really, really enjoy are, are, are memory and, and emotion and behavior. Let's start with memory. Uh, memory it can be short term which is usually handled in the prefrontal cortex, which is in the very front of the frontal lobe. Remember, we talked about the frontal lobe controls personality, emotions, intellect, judgment, social skills, all of that stuff. Memory is also involved there. And long-term memory seems to be in a special area of the temporal lobe. Remember, that's the one uh, just behind the ear. And in, um, in, in, um, in an area called the uh, hippocampus. So there's short-term memory and long-term memory, and they're in two separate areas of the brain, but they communicate with each other, obviously. Um, amnesia is when one of those areas or both of those areas uh, quit functioning, again, due to some kind of injury like we talked about earlier, usually. And it can be global. Global amnesia means you remember nothing. You remember nothing. You know, this is the Jason Bourne thing. You don't remember who you are, where you came from. You don't remember your name. You don't remember anything, anything about your past. Your, your memory is erased. It can be partial. So you can remember some things and not others. Uh, it can come and go. It can be erratic. It can be spotty. It can be Swiss cheese. It can also be retrograde and retrograde amnesia is actually extremely common. People who are knocked unconscious, uh, car accidents, blows to the head, whatever. They often do not only don't remember, obviously, the time while they're out, but they don't remember the time right before uh, for a, a certain period of time. It could be seconds, could be minutes, could be hours, could be days. It's not uncommon for someone knocked unconscious in an automobile accident not even remember to leave home, not even remember leaving home. You know, and they're driven for 15 minutes before they had the accident. They don't remember leaving home. The last thing they remember, they were, you know, maybe working on their computer, computer or watching TV. And then suddenly the next thing they know, you know, there, there's an ambulance there. Um, and that's very common, actually. And retrograde amnesia is common. And, and, and often it, recur, it returns. Often the memory does return, at least up to the point of loss of consciousness. Sometimes it never does. And they may remember certain things and not other things. And boy, you can sure use this in stories. Anterograde amnesia means the inability to form memories. So something's happening. You remember everything up to that moment, but then you can't remember what's coming next. You can't remember what happened. You can't remember the things that happened after the injury. So you're knocked unconscious and you wake up and you may remember the automobile accident, but now you don't form the memories of what's happening down the road. So 10 minutes later, someone may say, uh, were you in an ambulance? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. The, 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 the great movie Memento was about anterograde um, amnesia. And if you haven't seen that movie, uh, it is brilliantly done. And uh, mo Memento, fantastic movie. Memory is funny. And when it goes, it can come back spotty. It can come back partial. It can come back completely. It can come back in fits and spurts. It can come back suddenly. It cannot come back at all. The other now is emotions, and, and we talked about the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe and how they're related to this, and brain injuries can really cause personality changes and emotional changes, where um, a person who was very, very quiet and calm before becomes angry and combative and short-tempered, and a person who was... Uh, smart and, and, and intellectual and thoughtful suddenly becomes forgetful and becomes uh, frustrated easily because they can't remember things and because they, they, they don't understand things. Now, the temporal lobe is really fascinating because it does deal with emotions. And it's probably, along with the hippocampus and some other areas of the brain, involved in addictive behavior. In a certain, you know, whether if it's drugs or alcohol or sex or gambling or whatever, the temporal lobe probably has some role in that. Again, we don't understand all of this. They're trying to work on it. But I also remember when I was a resident, we had a young lady who was brought into the hospital 
uh, the emergency department, and uh, I was an internal medicine residency at the time, it was before my fellowship, and she was absolutely freaked out. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon. And the reason she was freaked out was she had gone to work, and she worked, every day was normal, and she um, left, told her, I'm going to go to lunch, and I'll be back. And she was supposed to be back at 1. Well, she never showed up. And then she walks back into the office about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody says, where have you been? She said, well, lunch. And they said, for four hours? And she said, what? And she suddenly realized that four hours of her life had evaporated. She did not remember where she was, what she did, anything. All she knew is that when she reached in her jacket pocket, there was a book of matches from the Warwick Hotel, which is like three blocks from the medical center there in Houston. And so she absolutely freaked out, as you would expect. So she shows up in the emergency room. To make a long story short, at the end of the day, the diagnosis was temporal lobe epilepsy. And that ep epilepsy is where the brain fires electrically and everything goes crazy. And it's funny. Most of them are, are, are global, uh, grand mal seizures. You've seen these where someone falls to the ground and has the jerking and salivating and biting their tongue sometimes and all this stuff. And it lasts a few minutes, then they wake up and then they don't remember much and they're real goofy and groggy. That's a grand mal seizure. Those are the typical kind, but they can be Local seizures. In other words, the seizure can just affect one arm. The, the left arm starts jerking for no reason, and that lasts for a couple of minutes and then goes away. That's often due to scars and infections and tumors and traumas and stuff like that in a certain area of the brain. And that area starts firing, and it just, just excites the area that controls the left arm. That would be in the parietal lobe. Remember, I said that controls motor function. So... Those are generalized seizures and localized seizures. But what about one in the temporal lobe that doesn't really have anything to do with, 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 with your activity and your sensory and all this, but it has to do with emotions and, and those kinds of things, uh, memories and, 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 and putting things together, um, understanding situations. Um, when that happens, the person's personality can change completely. And they may not form memories for this thing, and, and, and they go and do and say and, and act in ways that they never would before. And that's basically what happened to this young lady. What happened during those four hours, nobody knows. She doesn't remember. She'll probably never remember, but she was treated, and the temporal lobe epilepsy, the, you know, the last I knew was controlled, and she was doing fine. Uh, the famous Michael Crichton book, and they made a movie out of it, Terminal Man, was about this. It was about temporal lobe epilepsy. And the, the, the victim in this would, would um, uh, develop these seizures and would become violently angry and, and, and attack and all this and, and be, was a violent criminal. But it was because of this epilepsy that he had. And in this story, they implanted a, a brain stimulator, which is interesting that that kind of pre-told uh, brain pacemakers, which we have now, that we use particularly for, for things like Parkinson's disease. And it, they're investigating it now for OCD and some other things. But the, the point is, is that a pacemaker when it senses that the seizure activity, that the electrical activity is getting erratic, can start firing impulses and correct it, almost like cardioverting your heart back to normal, you know, the shock and CPR. So it kind of reorganizes the brain activity so that the seizure goes away and the behavior returns to normal. Um, in this case, things didn't go well. And I'll let you see the movie or read the book to figure that out. And Let's look at a couple of other very odd cases, and uh, one of them, and again, there's links to this, is a guy named Mac Fedge, who was a 31-year-old guy, and uh, he had had a brain injury, and um, this was reported on back in 2013. And, and, and he used to be, they said before the injury, he was a guy with, you know, that was fun loving and easy. And, and he was like a leader. He was a, he was a guy that, uh, that, that was, that was very active, that, 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 that understood things and was just a good guy, pleasant to be around. But after the injury, 
he mainly just sat around and watched stuff happen. He became very introverted, uh, where before he was even temp tempered, then now he would have a burst of anger and, and acting out. Uh, it, it changed his entire personality. And as we talked about, it depends on the area of the brain and the type of injury, but we can, this often frontal lobe will do this and you can end up with, with significant changes in the personality. And then a very, very, very odd case was just recently reported in the last month that I saw was a, a woman in Britain named Hannah Jenkins. And uh, she was riding her bike and collided with another uh, bicycle rider and hit her head. And when she woke up, she could no longer speak English. She could only speak German. Now, the injury didn't make her learn German in her background. She, she was of German extraction. And so Germany was, German was a language that, that she understood, but it kind of knocked the British out of her. She could no longer speak English. Um, and so she reverted back to the previous language, the German that was maybe more deeply embedded in her brain, or maybe those memories were stored in a different area, an area that wasn't. But you can see how odd this is. And this this, as much as anything, underscores um, how complex and how convoluted the brain is. Um, it's um, This is such an unusual case. Uh, this doesn't happen often, but it doesn't mean you can't use it. Uh, how will she do down the road? Will she regain her ability to speak English? Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, but it's a fascinating case. So in summary... The brain is a very complex organ. It has incredible interconnections, incredible powers, and incredible things can go wrong with it. Um, like I said, I have a lot of links on the show notes uh, that you're going to be able to see. And you can look at this anatomy and the physiology, and it'll give you some links for further study and to look at these cases and to look at different things I've talked about here. But think about them. And you can use them in your stories. If you go online to, to, and you'll see many anecdotal stories about people who are suffering from these different things, and you can get some ideas for how to create your character and make your character a little different, make your character a little special, and use some, some, some anatomical and neurophysiological and personality things that, that, can, that can make for a very odd character. T. Jefferson Parker did one of the great ones, and I won't get into that here, but uh, he created a character in, um, that had synesthesia, and Robbie would see language as geometric squares of different colors, and it, it served as sort of a lie detector for him, whether if he saw, you know, purple squares or red triangles or whatever. I don't, don't remember. It's been a long time, but it's a great book. Uh, I think it's called Fallen, and it's um, it's about a head injury and a guy who then developed a synesthesia, which is uh, uh, where people see and smell and taste sounds uh, or see things and hear certain sounds. It's uh, they, the, the, the sensories get mixed somehow and so what you perceive as music someone else may see as a color or detect as a smell it's a very complex thing synesthesia is fantastic and it's been used by other writers but but uh, t jefferson parker jeff had probably did it better than anybody so in closing have fun with all of this. This is a huge, huge, huge subject. You're not ever going to understand all of it. I mean, Lord, I don't even anymore. Um, it's just a big topic, but there are a lot of fun, fun things you can explore that has to do with the human brain and the behavior and the emotions and, and, the, phys and the motor and sensory aspects of it that you can use in creating your characters. So, as always... There will be links to uh, things further study on both my website and my blog. So uh, check those out and look at some stuff. And I hope this helps you create some stories. So until next time, that concludes this episode of Criminal Mischief, the art and science of crime fiction. Have a great day.